Hello and welcome back. It's 8 p.m. UK time. So it is time to start our IVF webinar tonight. And we have another very interesting topic to discuss. And as always, I um, would like to thank you for joining us tonight. And I am sure it will be very useful today for you as well. And uh, well, first of all, let me just as always thank to our ambassadors and partners for their support because without them of course the events our stronger together events that wouldn't be possible therefore as always thank you for joining our initiative for your support and well again i would like to introduce you to our special guest tonight and it's Kaveh Mir Tahmasebi and he's actually the executive coach at PSI Executive Coaching located in London and he will be talking tonight about fertility journey coping with the turbulence uncertainties so he will be uh, able to I hope I believe so that he will be able to give you also some tips and then of course he will answer all of your questions as always remember you can type those in in the chat section and welcome hi Kavek. how are you feeling today feeling well good to be here caroline and thanks for organizing this thank you to you and the team for uh, for helping with all the back office work to get us to where we are now excellent thank you so much of course for joining us tonight as well and i believe that is it from me for now so you can begin with your presentation but let me just remind everyone that after this you can ask your questions or share any comments you wish so don't miss that chance as well and uh, well let's begin then okay thank you caroline well uh, good day guys good afternoon good morning good night good evening depending on where you're calling from the world so we're going to talk about ivf journey and the reason we call it ivf journey is is so that like any journeys when we want to take uh, from where we are to where we want to go we need to make sure that we are prepared as much as possible an ivf journey is yet another journey so let me start by asking this question what is one question or one of the questions that no Google, Siri or Alexia can answer for you. So I'm just going to pause for you to think. What is one of the questions that no Google, Siri or Alexia can answer for you? So have a think about it. Let's just give you guys a few minutes to think. And if any of you want to participate in interaction, put your, your thoughts, your idea in the text box. Okay, so we think that, the, that one of the key questions that no one can answer on our behalf is the question of how are you feeling today? Okay, uh, doesn't matter how clever the search engine is, doesn't matter how much access to knowledge they've got, uh, no one can answer this question for us. How are we feeling today at this moment? Now, let's just pause and ask the same question from ourselves. So we know Google, uh, Alexia, and Siri cannot answer that question. Let's see if we can answer that question. So if I say, how are you feeling at the moment? What would be your answer? Again, if you want to play along, and you want to put your responses in the text message, that also will be fun and we can kind of read them and, and try to have this more interactive. So let's just give you a few, more, a few more seconds to think about and then we'll continue. So if I was going to ask you, how are you feeling at this moment? What would be your response? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, great. Okay, so what we found uh, looking at various different uh, data is that roughly about two thirds of people have hard calm coming up with a feeling words. 
So when we ask them how you are feeling, about two thirds of people uh, find it quite challenging to come up with a feeling word. And typically, uh, on the screen, you can see a list of words that people use to express their feelings. Like, I'm fine, I, I, you know, I don't feel really fine, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed, frustrated, uh, uh, tired, bored, and so forth. So the question that uh, we have is this, that what makes us not to be able to answer one of the most common questions that we get asked every day and that is how are you feeling or how are you doing and typically i think most of us uh, or at least the majority of us have experienced the scenario where you know you meet someone and you say how are you feeling and they say uh, fine and they say how are you feeling and then we respond back by something like uh, i'm okay busy okay so it makes us think that why is it that this question that is asked so frequently, it's quite hard to have a very clear response to it. It might be the case that most of us, we've never trained on the emotional side as much as we have been trained on the intellectual side. So if you think about it, when we go to schools, universities, uh, and various different courses, uh, the focus majority of time is on the intellectual side, but not the emotional side. That could be one reason. The other reason could be that uh, particularly if it's a negative feeling, by expressing that, we might feel vulnerable, you know, as, as a, uh, we, we don't want to show weaknesses. And if we express a feeling that is not being perceived as positive, that might communicate that we are, uh, we are weak. So that could be another reason. So when I ask someone, how are you feeling? Uh, you know, uh, and they say, I'm, I'm feeling fine. For me, it's always the case that it's a polite way of saying, I don't want to share my feeling with you. Okay. So the question that we've got is that why is this, what, what is this got to do with uh, IVF and IVF journey? Why this is so important, uh, knowing about emotions, and why is it so important that we be able to express, uh, to identify, to understand, to express uh, our emotions using a better language. And in here, we use the term emotion scientist. So basically what we're saying is, uh, for people that embark on the IVF journey, you require various different resources. Uh, some some around the knowledge in terms of how the journey is going to be like, your decision makings, uh, funds, access to various clinics. And one of the other important resources for you is to have ability or right level of skills around emotions. So we kind of like to say that it's also important for us to be emotion scientists because to be able to again, identify to be able to understand, to label, to express and regulate our feelings during this journey could be hugely beneficial and it could make the journey a bit easier uh, than it possibly is with all the complexity and difficulties that we all face going through that. So let me tell you my story. Let me just share with you uh, how I ended up uh, on this research and what is my story. So my story started like this. 20 years ago when I got married, me and my wife decided we're not going to have a baby. So we thought, you know what, uh, let's not have a baby so we can go and travel, travel around the world and see things. So as it happened, uh, my wife got pregnant uh, probably about three or four months after we got married. So we got really excited. We, we were very pleased and we were looking forward to have our first baby. Little we knew, we knew that there was a, a problem. So after about three months, my wife had her first miscarriage. So uh, immediately our reaction was, okay, no problem, it's just a blip. And you know, if we just continue, we can try for the second baby and everything should be fine. Little we knew that we had another miscarriage, second time, uh, another miscarriage, third time, another miscarriage, fourth time, and on the fifth time, we managed to have our first uh, 
first baby. Okay, so it was kind of, oh my God, you know, from uh, something that we never even thought is a problem, all of a sudden we tried uh, over a couple of years, maybe almost three years, five times, and eventually we managed our first baby. And then, of course, we thought that this was just a one-off issue. And now that we've sorted it out, we can easily have our second one. So then what happened was we had the sixth mis miscarriage, seventh, eighth, and then on the ninth try, we managed to have our second son and uh, we decided to kind of stop there and, and uh, say that, that, that that is enough. So when people uh, ask me to explain what was that journey like, I always try to explain it using the iceberg kind of a metaphor. So the tip of the iceberg is things that we were paying a lot of attention to. For example, uh, which doctor we've got to go to, which, uh, which med uh, medicine we have to take, what are our options in terms of diagnostics and interventions, and how do we decide which route we want to, we want to take. Uh, and it was all about the tip of the iceberg, all the things that are quite visible. What was not quite obvious was the body of the iceberg, which was purely about the emotional fluctuations that each of us individually had. And it was even more challenging when we wanted to communicate and make decisions together. So the, the emotional part was all hidden and we were quite busy to pay attention to all the tangible, to all the uh, uh, things that are easier to see, easier to understand and easier to communicate about. And that was causing a lot of problem. And we realized that we are not capable to be able to identify, understand, express, regulate our emotions. We were just ignoring them. And I think if it wasn't because of very different intervention that we took at the time, Ignoring the emotions could have caused us more problem than actually the mis miscarriage. Okay, so that's the reason that I got interested to really start kind of seeing what is happening and how can we help this. So during the rest of the session, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about what are the characteristics of IVF journey. Then we're going to talk about why we feel so much emotional change and fluctuation as we go through this journey. And thirdly, we're going to start talking about a particular way, a particular metaphor or framework that could help us to become a better emotion scientists as we are embarking through the IVF journey and all the turns and all the decisions that we have to make. So, Let's start by talking about the, the actual journey first. Okay, so the journey that uh, we can say IVF journey has got a number of characteristics that uh, makes it quite challenging and unique. The very first one is turbulence. So why is it turbulence? is because everything changes so rapidly that at some point we feel that we do not have the capacity to actually deal with the change. And that is the turbulence dimension of IVF journey. There are lots of uncertainty. I mean, we all know with all the advancement in uh, medication uh, in this field, most of the intervention in the best scenarios have a chance of success of maybe 50, but most likely less than 50. So it doesn't matter what we try to do, there's always an element of uncertainty within IVF journey. There is also a dimension of novelty. You see, most of us have never learned about how to have babies probably as much as we've learned on how to try and prevent of not having babies. You know, all the education that we see in the, in the school, for example, is how, how to be careful, what to do and not to do. 
to reduce your chance of not having a baby. Not many of us have been educated on this journey and hence the novelty of it. Hence that for most of us, when we embark on this journey, it's very new. It's not quite uh, obvious of what we need to do and how the events are going to unfold. Plus that the uncertainty and the turbulence makes it quite hard that uh, that anyone would know how this journey is going to turn out. And of course, it is quite ambiguous in a way that all the relationship and causation of various events is not obvious. So we could see certain people do certain intervention, take certain medicals, and it all works. And similar people will go through the same route and they end up in the dead end. Or things would unfold for them very differently. And the causation of all these events is not quite obvious. It's very ambiguous and it's very hard to understand. So knowing these characteristics, what does that mean? Well, if we compare two scenarios, of course, we use the term norm, depending on what you mean by norm. But basically, what we mean, what we mean by norm is a journey that there is less turbulence there's less uncertainty, novelty, and ambiguity. Our emotional response is much more smoother. So as we change our feelings, uh, the pattern is, is, is much more predictable. In the tuna journey, the turbulence, uncertainty, novelty, and ambiguity, the emotional response is very rapid. The peaks are much higher. And the rate of change is much faster because of all the four dimensions that we talked about. Okay. And that makes navigation of this journey uh, much, much, much more harder because of fluctuation of the emotions that we see in there. Okay. So, for example, you know, uh, we could have uh, uh, quite optimistic that something is going to happen. And in a very short period of time, that turns into informed pes uh, pessimism. Uh, we could then all of a sudden be quite hopeful. And then we again turn back to uh, informed optimism. And then again, we go back and we become more uh, pessimistic because something is not working. So the whole change of emotion is very rapid. It's really fast and the peaks and downs are much larger. So being equipped with the emotional skills in such a journey is even more important than when we are navigating through what we call a norm journey, where these four dimensions do not exist or they're not at least as exaggerated as they are within the IVF journey, okay? so. These four characteristics are very important that makes the IVF journey quite a special one. But how about us? Why is it that, why is it that we also have quite a bit of change in our emotions within IVF journey? Well, in order to answer that, we can use the model of uh, David Rock is known as SCARF model, you know, the S for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. So what does this uh, model is talking about? This model is saying that we have a social needs. Uh, and our social needs is almost the same way as, uh, as our needs for food and water. And these five items, these five domains would activate either primary reward or primary threat. So when these five items exist, we feel relaxed, we feel rewarded. When these five items do not exist, psychologically, we feel threatened. And of course, when we feel threatened, our normal reaction becomes just fighting, fleeing, or freezing. So let's quickly have a look at the five characteristics or five social needs that happens quite a bit during IVF journey. So the first one is around status. 
okay? So human holds a representation of a status in relation to others when in conversation. And this affects mental process in many ways. The brain thinks about status using similar circuit processing for numbers. And one's sense of status goes up when one feels better than another person. So with an IVF journey, at some point, if not all of us, some of us would have questions similar to this, that am I not good enough? And is this the reason that I am not able to naturally do what other people are doing? Does that, does that mean that I score less than other people? Of course, all of these are just psychological perception. And remember, we've said that when these five items are not there, we feel threatened. And the threat is almost as much as a physical threat. So we can see our status is uh, uh, it's under question. The next thing that we need is certainty. So we have the question constantly of, will I succeed? So uh, human holds a, uh, a need to be able to know and predict what the future is going to be. So it's very important that uh, the brain uh, has a pattern recognition machine that is constantly trying to predict the near future. The brain likes to know the pattern occurring moments to moments, okay? And it craves certainty so that prediction is possible. Now, within the IVF journey, because of uncertainty, that need is constantly not being met. Without the prediction, the brain must use dramatically more resources, okay? Uh, involving more energy, uh, which is more intensive in prefrontal cortex, front part of the brain behind the eyes, uh, to process moment-to-moment -moment experiences. So the uncertainty of IVF journey, it almost drains us because we cannot predict the future and we crave and we need to know what the future is going to be. So that also causes us uh, uh, a magnitude of uh, feeling of being threatened. The third item within the SCARF model is looking at autonomy. So autonomy is basically is, is the perception of exerting control over one's environment, a sensation of having choice. It's very important for us to feel that we have choice. Now, Within this journey, within the IVF journey, we do not have as much, as, as much choice as, as we could possibly want. And the typical question that goes through our head would be things like, why I cannot do what I want to do? Why I cannot try this? Why, would not, why do I not have option? to do it in this particular way, and I'm forced to do it in a way that possibly is not my first choice. So you can see that the lack of autonomy that happens within the IVF journey uh, amplifies the feeling of psychological threat that we might feel as we are going through the journey. So let's look at the last one, the relatedness. So what is this about? Well. This involves deciding whether we are in or out of social group. So we as a human, we like to feel we belong to a group. And each of us have a, a, a psychological definition of what group we want to belong to. And uh, people naturally like to form tribes. And when they experience sense of belonging, it feels like a reward. And when they feel they do not belong to the group, it feels like a threat. So in the absence of a safe social interaction with the group that we feel we should belong, 
we could generate a threat response. Now, typically what happens with an IVF uh, journey is that we start seeing ourselves and compare ourselves to the norm group that we feel we should belong. Typically, when does this happen? The triggers of this is when we attend birthdays, for example, of other kids, uh, 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 baby showers, if you're in the UK or in the countries that celebrate such a cultures. And these would trigger us where we start kind of comparing ourselves to the, to, the, to the psychological group that we think we should belong. And as we start perceiving that we don't belong to that group, our brain would see that as a threat. So you can see that why IVF unit is uh, IVF journey is such a uh, such a, a, a emotional fluctuated journey for most of us because all the five uh, parts and the furnace the last one is under question. Uh, we are not uh, getting enough of it, which then creates the threat response within us. Okay, so the last one is the furnace, uh, and almost in the same way that we crave uh, for status, for uh, certainty, uh, autonomy, uh, and, and so forth, fairness is also very important. As a human, we want to feel that we have been fairly treated. We like to see fairness, and when we see that, we see it as a reward. And again, if fairness is not there, we see this as a threat. And you can see within the IVF journey from time to time, the thought and the question similar to this of why me keeps coming up. And of course, the question of a why me could potentially, if not for all of us, for most of us, trigger the fairness need in the mind. And because it's lacking, because we feel that what we are getting is not fair, that creates a threat in our mind and all of this all of this if it's not managed properly could end up into what we call a very kind of a negative stress so what is a stress stress is basically simply is when the we perceive the demand and perceived our ability, and we think that our ability is less than the perceived demand, the difference between the two is a stress if the subject is important for us. So having the lack of all the scarf items within the IVF uh, journey would create a perception that the demand is much more, much higher than our ability to cope with it. And of course, when this happens psychologically, that's exactly when we feel stress. Now, of course, technically, as we all know, stress is not a bad thing as is shown in the stress curve. So we can see if we are, if there is no stress, we kind of, it is, we are bored and we are uh, underachieving. What happens with an IVF? journey because of the four characteristics of the journey of the journey the tuna and because of the five needs that the individual requires the scarf we tend to shift to the right of the stress curve where we call the distress area okay and this is where the problem happens because we end up in the dis distress area. And when we stay on the right-hand side of the graph, we could have physical and psych psychological symptoms appearing. Physical, like weakening immune system, frequent illness, uh, or even longer recovery. And psychological, things like feeling overwhelmed, out of control, uh, low self-esteem, feeling inadequate, uh, powerless, uh, sometimes hopeless, confused, disorientation, uh, misunderstanding others, uh, and sometimes as much as feeling lonely or loneliness. So when the four dimension of the journey, the tuna and the scarf happens, 
If we don't deal with our emotions, we are shifted and we stay on the right hand side of the stress curve, which technically we call it distress, which means is a negative stress, is a place that maybe we can go there temporarily for a short period of time, but we do not want to stay for a long time. Because if we do psychologically and physically, uh, we are going to see uh, symptoms appearing uh, within our, our physical body, biologically and psychologically. Okay, so, so far we've explained that a uh, number of things. So these are the things that probably we want to take away from, from the session. One is that our feelings are important. Our feelings deserve to be addressed respectfully and fully. And of course, our feelings are sometimes disruptive and are productive, but we need to be able to identify our emotions, understand them and use them in healthy way. So it's interesting that uh, till recently, 1980s, um, there was a strong belief that emotions are noise, they are useless, they slow us down and they're kind of getting in the way of achieving goals. And the typical advice was just get over it and just pretend they're not there. Now, what we know now is this, that we cannot ignore the feelings. We cannot suppress them. It just doesn't work uh, because our feelings don't heal themselves. And uh, a good example is they pile up, uh, as we said, like a debt and eventually uh, we have to pay them back. Eventually, they are due. Okay? So we need to do something about them. And this is where we kind of think about, okay, fine, so we know there's a tuna, we know there's a scarf. What is the solution? How can we prepare for the journey? Well, we use a particular model based on... Uh, 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 five things, five skill sets that we try to teach people to learn. So number one is recognizing our own or other emotions. Two is once, you, once we recognize it, understand the source and the influence that that would have on our behavior. Third, we work to be able to have a vocabulary to label emotions. Fourth, we need to learn to express our feelings and invite empathy from others. Why and how invite empathy is because if we learn how to adequately, according to the norm, to the context, to the culture, have the right way of expressing that feeling, feeling, we can then communicate and hopefully be understood much uh, with a higher chance than expressing in a way that is not adequate for that context. And, and, and finally, the fifth item is about regulating the emotions to be able to deal with, with when the intensity goes up and when there's a huge drop and how we can regulate that to use it uh, for helping us to achieving the, the informed decisions that we want to make. So in the time that we've got together, we are going to just look at one of these items, which is recognizing, okay? So we're going to talk about recognizing. We've said that there is an understanding side. So understanding uh, part of the, uh, uh, the model is really about uh, being able to know the cause of emotions and see how they influence our behaviors, which help us to make better decisions. So we're going to look at the labeling, and then we're going to talk about expressing, and finally, we're going to talk about regulation. So here we're going to talk about the very first item, which is recognizing. So how do we recognize our emotions? What's the quickest way that we can recognize our emotions? So, understanding our emotions 
our emotions is almost like we use a metaphor. They're like newspaper that tell us news from inside to out without being able to understand this newspaper, which has lots of messages of what's happening within us, we would have difficulty utilizing the message to make better decisions. So in the very first part of it, we are going to be comfortable to make and identify and recognize the emotions. So I'm just going through a couple of the slides fast, aware of the time. So, so how do we do it? Number one, we need to know that emotional skills is not intuition, is not opinion, is not instinct, and is not a skill that if we are not born with it, uh, we cannot learn it. It's a learnable skills that all of us can learn. The reason that maybe some of us are not at, as good at it is probably because we've never had opportunity to practice them and learn them, okay? So let me just share with you one of the tools that we use in recognizing the emotions. And this is what is known as a mood detector. So how does the mood detector works? Well, simply mood detector is made of two different axes. The X axis, pleasantness, and the Y axis, the energy. So of course, the pleasantness uh, starts from uh, the, act, the, the feeling that we've got is not pleasant at all, it's almost like minus five. And the other end of it is actually very pleasant and is five. But also there's a dimension of energy. So if there is no energy in the feeling, it's almost minus five and it's really energetic, that's number positive five. So using this grid, we can almost categorize what is the feeling and identify the area that feeling belongs to. So you probably all heard it when we say feeling blue. What feeling blue basically means, it means that uh, the energy is very low and pleasantness is also very low. So example of this would be when we are stressed, where we are tired, uh, and and uh, we are not in the mood to do anything, okay? It's almost kind of a negative energy and negative pleasantness. Now, if we kind of look at the, 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 the right, the, the, the red on the top uh, left-hand side, we can see this quadrant uh, is where the, there is low pleasantness, uh, but high energy. So low pleasantness, high energy, this is where we might feel anxious, frustrated, uh, could be even scared, uh, could even be um, too much assertive or even competitive. When we are in the area of the red, kind of a red feeling, uh, we can kind of expect that our, 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 our blood is pumping faster, uh, we can see that we feel much ready to take action uh, and we are uh, ready to almost either to flee fast or fight. And fighting is probably the most um, re reaction that is associated with this quadrant, okay? If we go to the, uh, the green uh, side, we see that in here we've got pleasantness, but the energy is low. So this could be an example of a, of a feeling of being peaceful, contented, serene, uh, maybe even mellow. And here the body uh, feels at ease. Uh, so we can kind of imagine that when we are in here, we are breathe, breathing very slowly. And we potentially could have a very kind of a gentle smile uh, communicating, kind of being safe and secure, okay? So we can see that depending on where we are uh, on a different quadrant, of course, I didn't explain the, um, uh, 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 the yellow part. The yellow is where we are uh, high pleasant 
and high energy. So this is where we are quite enthusiastic, we are surprised, we are happy, we are eager to explore and do things very differently. So one of the things that we work is that by, by teaching people that go through IVF, a very simple mood detector. And we encourage them to keep a journal of where they are within different boundaries, different areas, the red, the blue, the yellow, and the green. And we would encourage them to see that how long they've stayed there. Is it the right time for them to move to different area within the graph, within the chart? And if yes, which area they should move that would serve them best? And remember that here is not about blue is bad or, or red is bad or yellow or green is bad. All of them are good, and we do not want to ignore them. We want to honor them, but we want to be aware of them, aware of where we are and how we feel, and within that area, what sort of things we can do and we cannot do. So if we are in the red part, where energy is very high and pleasantness is very low, which most of us from time to time do go in that area, we know that it's probably not a very good time to think analytical and uh, have a collaboration uh, idea in head because energy is just too high and pleasantness is very low. This is where we kind of in the mood of either fighting or fleeing. Okay, uh, there's no time for collaboration. Now, if we want to make a very important decision where we need to collaborate, possibly we want to be within the yellow area, ideally, where we are open to idea, we hear each other better, we can analyze and look at different uh, ideas much more openly. It's perfectly fine that during the IVF journey, from time to time, we might go to the blue area where we think things haven't gone right for me, they're not pleasant, and I am quite low in energy. And that's an area where we can recharge, we can reevaluate our resources and get ready for the next action in the journey. But you see, by knowing where we are, we become aware of what's happening for us. And more importantly, we can communicate much better with people around us. So of course, we are not just talking about the first part, which is about identification. And, and, and due to time limitation, we cannot explore uh, the, the understanding, the labeling, the expression, and the regulation part of it, which we typically do uh, through about six, seven sessions uh, with people to take them through the whole emotional um, awareness and almost kind of get them ready to become more like an emotional scientist, to become much more in tune with what is happening for them moment to moment as they are going through the IVF uh, journey and also what they can and they cannot do when they are within different areas. So, Number of things we want to we want you to take away from here. One is keep track of where you are on the grid. So the grid is very simple: pleasantness and energy. Okay, and minus five to plus five, minus five to plus five. Keep track of where you are. Be aware of where your partner or the person that's supporting you is. Because remember that it doesn't mean that we, we all move together into different, uh, different areas. It could possibly be that we are in a different area and very possible that we could even be in an opposite area. So one could be in red, one could be in green. So one is unpleasant um, uh, and lots of energy to do things. And the other one is quite positive, but there is no energy. And you can see if we are not aware of this emotional state that we are in, where would the communication go? It's almost as if we are speaking a different language to each other. So third is assess how long you've been feeling the colors. So we said none of the colors are bad, but we do not want to stay within the color more than it's appropriate, it's suitable 
for that part of the journey that we're going through. Okay, so for example, if we have to make certain key decisions in there, it's okay, for example, uh, to kind of feel yellow, but we know that we need to kind of shift our feelings to different area within the graph to get ourselves ready for that big particular event that is going to happen. And or, for example, we might think that red is not an appropriate place to be in. And by that awareness, we can start planning and be more proactive to shift ourselves within the grid. So during a tuna journey, uh, you need to know that you also move very rapidly between the colors. And, and, and that's what we explained at the very beginning, that because the journey has four characteristics, you know, it's turbulence, uncertainty, novelty, and ambiguity, the shift between the parts of the grid is very rapid. And hence, having this, uh, using this device more and more to know where you are, it's, it's even more important. It's like you're going through a journey and your car is going so fast that uh, uh, the need for the GPS to inform you where you are at any point is even more important now because if you take your eyes off where you are, you could potentially make the wrong decisions or at least not make the most suitable informed decisions because you're not aware of your emotions. So finally, be aware of the needs uh, that are different depending on where you are in the grid. If you are yellow, what your emotion is telling you is telling you that calm down, be on your own if that's what you want, to reflect and recharge. If you are at red, your body is telling you, I'm giving you lots of energy to deal with, the, with this obstacle, with this decision that's hard for you to make. So is all the other quadrants. So each of them would also communicate to you what you can and what you cannot do. And paying attention to that is very important. Now, we talked about very briefly about one of the items, which was really about recognizing. Uh, we do a similar type of things in terms of introducing tools on how you can understand it. So once you know where you are, what is that telling you? what would be the vocabulary for your emotions and you see once you know where you are identify it once you know what is the cause of that emotion and you label it you are now ready to express it so we practice with the particular ways of expressing different emotions that would be much more helpful than other ones, taking into consideration the context, the norms, and the culture. And finally, once we know how to identify, how to understand, how to label, and how to express, we work on regulation of the emotions. In other words, how can we have control on tuning the intensity of the emotion in a much more proactive way rather than reactive way. Okay, so I probably have taken more time than initially was allocated to this uh, presentation. I do apologize. I want to sincerely thank you for uh, being and staying in this presentation. Sometimes it's not quite hard to pay attention to someone is speaking for such a long period of time. I hope you've taken something from here. And if you haven't taken anything, one thing that I would say is that being aware of your emotions during the IVF journey is one of the key resources that uh, I think is important for you to have to take and use as you going through this, this journey. Thanks very much, Caroline. Excellent. Thank you so much for that very passionate presentation. Indeed, lots of useful tips. And well, that was really brilliant. Thank you so much. And well, um, now it will be time for uh, our patients' questions. Um, so, well, are you ready for them? Let's try. Do my best. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. We do have very first question right here. And let me just remind everyone that if you would like to share any comments or anything, uh, of course, or ask anything, 
go ahead and type those in. And the question is right here. So in case you are on a different color, how can you self-regulate to go to a different one? That's a fabulous question. That's a fabulous question. So I'm assuming that when you say you are in different colors, you mean you and the person that's supporting you, who are that person is your partner or the person who supports you, you are in different colors. So first, first step is identify you are in different color. You see, immediately by just kind of saying, you know, you know, when we start the uh, presentation, the question was, how are you feeling? So rather than saying, fine, okay, bored, overwhelmed, we can even say red, yellow, green, blue. But just knowing we are in different parts, we could get ready that our emotions are totally different in terms of how pleasant we're feeling and also how much energy we have within us. So immediately brings some kind of understanding of what's happening. Of course, you know, we talked about the, the whole skill set. We only talked about recognition. And the next part is about understanding. So as soon as we know where we are and, and where the other, other party or, or whoever support us is, we then have an ability to understand what is cause of that emotions. So for example, Anger typically is a message that comes from inside that tells us maybe there is some perception of injustice, not fairness. So you see, as soon as I go and I say I'm red, that gives me an indication that somewhere, even subconsciously, something I perceive not to be just and fair, okay? And same underlying cause we have for various different emotions. So you see, at least as soon as I know, for example, Caroline, you're red, and I can now start asking the right question to sympathize with you and understand that why maybe you're red, okay? And remember that, the third part, which is labeling, is then we use the right words to communicate. And if we are familiar with the language of emotions, how quickly we can, we can then go to expressing in an appropriate way for other people to empathy with us, knowing not only how pleasant we feel or not, how much energy we have or not, what's the cause of that, what do I even call that? And how far is my feeling to yours? You see, immediately, we've got a much more data to be able to deal with emotions. Something that for most of us, you know, when we get emotional, we just react to it. Or, or sometimes if we are uh, uh, in the green or in the yellow, we don't react because there is no energy. Okay, we just don't want to just avoid or we just deny, okay? So for example, another thing is that if I am in low energy, it's very likely that I am more inclined to avoid or to even deny the subject. So my partner immediately knows that that is a normal reaction for someone who is at that part of the graph. And that brings understanding and empathy between people. Excellent. Thank you so much for clarifying that and for your question, because I mean, lots of uh, people are wondering how actually to do it. So thank you so much for those tips. Uh, everyone should definitely take this message home. Definitely useful. Um, and there is another question, actually. Um, let me show you this from the very same patient. I am living the IVF journey in a constantly negative fog because it has been imposed on me by others. How can I get out of the victim mode? Oh, very good question. So you see here where we can look at the scarf model. Okay. Remember that in a scarf model is about status, you know, is about certainty, uh, is about autonomy. Okay. Now we as a human need to have autonomy. If we feel we do not have choice, our brain sees that as a threat. 
okay? And, 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 and it's quite interesting that sometimes this threat and the part of the brain that gets triggered, it could be similar to a physical threat. So it is as, as, as much as that, our perception of that threat. So if, for example, we are going through this journey where we feel that we have no autonomy, you see, even when we enter the journey, we have no autonomy. Now, if we, if we, if we force to take on the journey, forget about being in the journey, there is even less autonomy. That is the threat. And of course, our brain would treat that as negative and immediately the pleasantness goes down. And if we perceive that we are out of control and we have no control, our energy level drops down as well. And this is where we stay in the kind of a bottom left quadrant of the graph, you know? How can we move up if we investigate and we think, for example, autonomy is the reason we need to work on that and see how, can, how we can bring that feeling of being in control back to the person to gradually cali calibrate and adjust the threat level. Perfect. Once again, thank you so much for your yet another question. And of course, uh, for your help with that as well. Next one is quite a longer um, uh, question, but also with additional information. Okay, so I will read it out. Have a look. I have undergone... 11 IVFs, eight with my own eggs and two with donor cycle, have tried to use another two donors, but their genetic testing result were not compatible with my husband's results. The last cycle, the donor accidentally gave herself the trigger injection and now refuses to do a cycle again. After about the fourth cycle, I was furious each time I miscarried, but managed to get over it. Unfortunately, this time I thought it was not I was going to have a heart attack, sleepless nights, high blood pressure, etc. for months. The clinic did not give me any support, which is why I'm changing clinics for our last attempt with another donor and surrogate this time too. How do I stop myself from being angry yet again as now I'm getting increase, increasingly agitated waiting for genetic testing results of the fifth donor? Okay, it's, it's a fantastic question. And you can see that, you know, we've said anger not always, uh, and this is where we, we need more time to kind of go in, in more detail, but, but anger or the red part is when we feel there is injustice and a lack of fairness. <laughs> that typically creates anger within us, okay? Uh, and remember that this is all psychologically perceived. Uh, because here we're not talking about the truth or whether you know we have the right or not that's a different question it's just when we perceive injustice has happened and we haven't been dealt with fairly then the normal reaction of a body is to take us to the red and remember in the red uh, is telling us things are not pleasant so it's trying to focus us narrow us down into limited options because it doesn't want us to spend too much energy exploring thing and it gives us a lot of energy which could have the symptoms that we talked about for example perception or maybe even uh, in, in reality the heart rate would, would go up the blood pressure would go up and our body says i am getting you ready for the red grid now the problem there is that if we don't understand that and we don't know how to regulate and express it in the right way, that's when, remember we talked about the stress graph, that's where we end up to the right of the chart and we stay there for a long time. And if we stay there long time, we see exactly as our friends were saying, some of the biological and psych psychological symptoms that was expressed in here. So the first thing is we are in the red now and we've got to try to see and reframe our perception of where the justice or fairness was not happening. Now, if the intensity of that is quite hard, we need to work with someone using various different intervention, like CBT, to try to reframe the, the scenario for us so that 
we can reduce our perception of injustice and the fairness and low that because once we feel things are not as unfair as we perceive them or un, or as unjust as we perceive them we gradually move out of that quadrant now for me to suggest a very kind of a detailed intervention is probably not a uh, right thing to do because obviously we need to know exactly what's happening what's the level of intensity of the emotions and then based on that we can try different intervention to see what's the right way to shift the person to different quadrant but what's very important is at least we know i am in red i stayed in red for a long time if i stay there for a long time that's not good because i'm going to have uh, physiological and psychological symptoms if I stay in the quadrant, in any quadrants for too long. All right, thank you so much once again for um, for your question, for sharing um, all the details and of course for your advice, your explanation to this as well. And uh, well, I will show you a follow-up, okay? And uh, from the very same patient. Um, I decided to arm myself with as much knowledge as I could to make the right decisions. This is the um, comment from the same patient. Yeah, so so here we can see that, you know, we all crave certainty, okay? And and one way to, to address that craving is by having more knowledge because having more knowledge, hopefully, would enhance our chance of predicting the future better by taking a better informed decisions. Okay, that is perfectly fine. The only challenge is this: that that works in a simple world. What I mean in a simple world, in a world where the turbulence is not there, uncertainty is not there, or at least is in a reduced amount. Ambiguity and novelty also maybe is there, maybe it's not there, and if it's there, it's in a small amount. With the IVF journey, we know this four dimension exists. So, of course, the more knowledge we have, we're going to feel more comfortable because the certainty is, is the uncertainty is reduced. But we need to know that this journey has got this four dimension almost. Uh, embodied within it okay and regardless how much knowledge we have probably we might be able to reduce the turbulence slightly the certainty or uncertainty slightly the ambiguity and novelty possibly slightly but we cannot eliminate them and this is where we need to kind of then uh, be happy uh, well be open to have various feelings throughout the journey and equip ourselves to deal and welcome the, uh, the feelings and use them appropriately. But definitely, of course, gaining the knowledge is great because that helps with uncertainty. Perfect. Thank you so much indeed for that as well. Um, okay, for now at least, it looks like this is our last question, but I definitely encourage anyone, if you would like to ask anything at all, go ahead and type those questions in. And the question is here. Your personal story was so inspiring to me. How did you get over the repeated miscarriages and to continue? Uh, I think, um, you know, uh, there's uh, the other psychological things in there. And uh, one of them is, is resilience. I've got a feeling that I was very lucky to have uh, an amazing wife uh, in all different areas, but more importantly, she's a very resilient person. I think she taught me how to be resilient. And what, what I mean by resilience is how do we respond in the event of adversity and unexpected experiences, okay? Uh, and it's quite interesting that, again, resilience, even though some people think, you know, you're either born with it or not, is a skill that one can learn. So I could say maybe something that really helped me in that scenario was to, to have a role model, my wife, that was showing me how she was resilient uh, 
at the time of adversity and expected experiences that we weren't expecting and we were shocked and we were not quite sure how to deal with it. So I've learned a lot from her skills and I think by building up our resilience, we were much more comfortable to deal with these unexpected events that was happening to us. All right. Thank you so much indeed for uh, for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, lots of patients uh, um, feel that they they would they are ready to give up because it's it can be of course very very um, difficult. But um, thank you so much for inspiring and uh, for sharing all the tips. As I mentioned, this is definitely useful. And uh, I'm just waiting to see if there are any other questions. Of course, if not. We will be finishing, but um, this has been really, really helpful indeed. Um, someone is typing, so I just definitely want to make sure that uh, sure. we can, we will answer all the questions. This is a shout out, a shout out right here. Actually, thanks for your amazing presentation. You're welcome. And thank you very much, guys, wherever you are now. I don't know what time it is from where you're calling. Uh, it was my pleasure to, to have the opportunity. Thank you to you, Caroline, and your team. And more importantly, for your, for your wonderful questions. And, and just, just staying, in, staying with me is quite hard to kind of just have dialogue and, and, and speak for such a long time in, in, in a webinar setting. I appreciate that. Uh, and, uh, and, and good luck with your journeys, guys. You know. Uh, uh, sharing and supporting each other, as you guys says, would only make us stronger. Couldn't agree more, for sure. Okay, so thank you very much. A very interesting presentation, another one from the patient. So, uh, again, huge thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight as well, because, you know, those kind of topics are quite hard. So thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining and also asking your questions, uh, but also listening. Yes, you are all here uh, throughout the whole uh, webinar. So we are definitely um, happy that and hope that we are able to help you uh, even if a bit and of course if you if anyone would, of you would like to get in touch with Kavek and just uh, have some additional questions remember you can always do it with this site as well let me just send it to you and um, that way you can get in touch with Kavek and once again Huge thank you. It has been a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you are definitely inspiring. And I love how passionate you are when you are explaining everything. So, um, and also let me remind everyone that this has been recorded. So, of course, you will be able to find it on our website, My IV Offenses, but also on the YouTube channel. And if you follow us on our Facebook and Instagram, you will be updated about all the upcoming events. And as you know, there are more to come as well. I hope to see you back here at 6 p.m. UK time, at 8 p.m. UK time. Uh, some of you I know are very frequent attendees. So thank you to those that are meet, uh, go, uh, sorry, coming back to us every now and then. It's it's always great to, um, to host it for you. And Kavek, once again, Huge thank you. It has been a pleasure. And I hope we will be able to simply have another session like that. And I hope you've enjoyed this as well. Thank you. Pleasure, mine. Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye. Bye.